Lord, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. I don't know if you know this, and I'd actually be surprised if any of you did. Tonight is actually the 100th anniversary on this date of this style of liturgy for Christmas Eve, this nine lessons and carols style of Christmas Eve service. And another interesting tidbit, I'm full of these kinds of facts, uh, and someone might have known this, I would almost be surprised if somebody didn't know, it's actually the exact 200th anniversary of the writing of Silent Night, one of the last hymns, one of the more famous hymns. So you're in for a throwback service, right? The <laughs> old style Christmas Eve, but like every other time we gather as God's people to worship him and to hear our God of love, the Heavenly Father who sent his Son to be our Savior and who sends his Holy Spirit to give us faith, saving faith in that Savior. So now, as always, we worship in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please stand. <clears throat> Arise, shine, for your light has come. And the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. See, darkness covers the earth, and thick darkness is over the peoples. But the Lord rises upon you, and his glory appears over you. Nations will come to your light. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, <coughs> Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of the great joy that will be for all people. Today in the town of David a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. Glory to God in the highest. Christ who is lying in the manger. Today we read and learn anew in the Holy Scriptures the story of God's enduring love for his people. We see his promises made and his promises kept from the time immediately after the fall into sin until the act of redemption on the cross of Calvary. We rejoice that God's grace has appeared through this holy child born in Bethlehem, our Savior. But first we pray for all the people of the world that they would rejoice with us in the knowledge of the good news of Jesus Christ, and that they would join with us in our songs of praise and worship. We pray for all the people of our community and the members of our congregation. And because it pleases God our Savior, we remember in his name the poor and the defenseless, those who lack adequate food, those who are oppressed and feel the sadness of this world, those who feel alone and unloved. 
We especially remember those who do not know their Lord Jesus, those that do not love him, those who do not welcome him this Christmas because of their lack of faith. We lay these and all like requests in the hands of our gracious God as we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. First lesson, Genesis chapter 3, verses 8 through 15. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But The Lord God called to the man, where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, The woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me and I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all the livestock and all the wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. This is God's word. Genesis chapter 22, verses 15 through 18. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time and said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies and through your offspring, All nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. This is God's word.
Isaiah chapter 7, verses 10 through 14. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz, Ask the Lord your God for a sign, whether in the deepest depths or in the highest heights. But Ahaz said, I will not ask. I will not put the Lord to the test. Then Isaiah said, Hear now, you house of David. Is it not enough to try the patience of men? Will you try the patience of my God also? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. This is the gospel of our Lord. chapter 11, the first five verses. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the spirit of counsel and of power, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide by what he hears with his ears. But with righteousness he will judge the needy. With justice he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. With the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked. Righteousness will be his belt. And faithfulness the sash around his waist. This is God's word. <clears throat>
first chapter, verses 26 through 37. In the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I'm a virgin? The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who was said to be barren is in her sixth month, for nothing is impossible with God. The word of the Lord. Chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to his own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. This is the Gospel of our Lord.
Luke, the second chapter, verses 8 through 20. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. This is God's word. According to St. Matthew, the second chapter, the first 12 verses. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where's the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Christ was to be born. In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied, For this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and make a careful search for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and of incense and of myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. This is the word of God. <clears throat>
Testament letter to Titus, the second chapter, verses 11 through 14. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. This is God's word. and peace are yours from God our Father and our newborn King, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. The part of God's word for consideration this evening is recorded for us in the book of the prophet Isaiah, the ninth chapter, verses 2 through 7. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, the light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as men rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. This is the Gospel of our Lord. Dear friends in Christ, we're always looking for heroes, right? That person who's going to score that touchdown at the very end of the game to win the championship. The person that's going to knock in that, that, that go-ahead run in the bottom of the ninth inning. That person who's going to beat all the bad guys down and, and leave the world safe for peace and justice once again. And we find these, these heroes everywhere in the movies, right? And in the television programs and course in the sporting arenas and fields all over but these heroes that we look for why do we need these heroes so much why do we need someone who's going to do something great to make us feel better why do we need that someone to, to assure us that things are going to be okay the the good guys are going to win and the the bad guys are ultimately going to lose even if it's not this season eventually the good guys will win out 
It's amazing that these heroes seem to be the most necessary when things are the darkest and the bleakest. Did you know that's how Superman and Batman came into being? Both of them were created right as the world was falling into World War II. And things looked very dark and very bleak. And we needed characters like these Superman and Batman. We needed some heroes to make us think that everything would be better. That somehow right would win out. But sometimes our heroes just can't do it for us. Sometimes we build up these heroes and we find them getting arrested in society. We find them having to go through rehab. And even these greatest of great heroes, right? Even Superman's got his kryptonite and his little weaknesses and failings. And we all know about that dark side of Batman. And of course, the real heroes that we try and prop up in our life, they let us down too. Where can we find one of these heroes who won't ever let us down? You know what I'm going to say, don't you? Right here in God's word. The one that Isaiah, the prophet of God, is pointing to as he shows us a real hero. The hero who never falls. The hero who has no weaknesses. Who never lets us down. This hero who's the coming Messiah that he was predicting. Now as he starts to lay out his resume, it doesn't look that impressive at first, right? To us a child is born. To us a son is given. I, I would like a little bit better of a superpower for my hero than this. But actually because our biggest problem was sin. Sin that puts us at odds with the almighty God. Sin that, that, that makes us disqualified from being in his presence and having his blessings. This hero had to come and be one of us. A human like us to be able to take our place and do what we couldn't. To take our place so he actually had to be under the law. So he had to be subservient to fulfilling those requirements, those rules of the Almighty God. And it had to be someone who could suffer, someone who could bleed, someone who could really feel and sense all the fury and pain of hell, someone who could die. It had to be one of us. And so God says in Galatians 4, God sent his son born of a woman, born under the law to redeem those under law. It had to be one of us, but it had to be more than that because God's word also tells us so clearly through the psalmist that no man can redeem the life of another. The cost for a soul is just way too high. It takes too great of a price. It had to be someone like us, but at the same time, it had to be someone not like us. It had to be someone who's true and very God. The someone who said in John chapter 10, I and the Father are one. See, our hero is one of us, but he's also one with God. I could never say it more beautifully than that hymn we just sang. That's my favorite Christmas song, by the way. And since I get to pick the songs, uh, <laughs> well, of course we're going to have that every, every time at Christmas. But veiled in flesh, the Godhead see, hail the incarnate deity. Pleased as man with man to dwell, Jesus, our Emmanuel. Only this Jesus, our Emmanuel, God with us. One of us and one of God at the same time. That was the only one who could do it. That was the only hero who was qualified to fight this fight in our place. He was the only one who could win it and he was the only one who could pay the payment. Only as God and man at one and the same time could he fight our fight for us and could he win that fight for us. And he has won. Even this prophet Isaiah, writing 700 years before the fact, sees this thing so clearly and knows how God is so clearly that he speaks of this in the past tense as something that's already happened. Just like in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke and the rod of the oppressor. It's such a sure thing that he can use the past tense to talk about this, even though it wouldn't happen for another 700 years. And why could he be so sure? Because like he ends up, the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Of course, God said so, he comes through. He always does. He always has, and he always will. He says, just like that, that one battle, and, and, and you don't remember this because it was just so long ago, but everybody in the nation of Israel would remember this one. They think back all the way to those ancient times, and they would remember this battle against the Midianites. Oh, the Midianites came in, and they brought the Amalekites and a whole bunch of other rites. All these eastern people, and it said... Just their camels. And only the really, really important ones among them had the camels. But just their camels completely outnumbered all the forces of the Israelites. 
Oh, they had 30,000, 32,000 brave soldiers. Okay, 10,000 brave soldiers. The other 22,000 ran home at the first opportunity. But the, it, the odds were so overwhelming, it just looked like a cruel joke against them. And so what did they do? What did their God do? Oh, he whittled them down to just 300. He says, that 10,000 is way too many. Now I'll go up against those 300,000 or so Midianites. And now I'll give you this great and glorious victory. And of course he did, only to point to an even greater champion. Nothing in comparison with this champion, this hero, who took the field of battle alone and faced all the forces of evil, all the worst enemies. The, the, the dark side of the Marvel comics got nothing on these guys because this was sin and Satan and death and hell. And he completely defeated all of them. Oh, it looked like he was getting it handed to him. At first, it looked like they were getting the worst of him, but that was actually what it took to pay the price. That's what it took to pay the debt that we owe the Almighty God. That's what it took to forgive all of our sins. And by rising from the dead after that battle, he proved how overwhelmingly he had defeated the forces of evil because now this was a battle that would never have to be fought again. As he says, every warrior's boot, every garment rolled in blood will be fuel for the fire. And that means peace. Peace for good. The prince of peace took care of the penalties for sin and he took care of the demands of God and he left the Almighty with nothing more that he could be angry at us about. And that means real peace, the forgiveness of sins, a, a, a conscience that doesn't have to worry, that knows I have the most powerful force in the universe on my side always. Yeah, always. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. And he puts us into this great kingdom by giving us this thing called faith. The faith that he keeps in us and keeps making that peace in us with and strengthens us and builds us up with by that wonderful counseling word that he used to give us the faith in the first place. And so we have the peace, the peace of knowing even the darkest of the darkest times, our hero is one of us. Our hero is for us. Our hero is with us all the time. What a hero. What a life. Merry Christmas. Amen. Having heard the word of our God, we now join in confessing the faith that he's given us. We do this this evening using the words of the second article and its meaning as you find it on the bottom of page 12. Would you please stand? I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. What does this mean? I believe that Jesus Christ, true God, begotten of the Father from eternity, and also true man, born of the Virgin Mary, is my Lord. He has redeemed me, a lost and condemned creature, purchased and won me from all sins, from death and from the power of the devil, not with gold or silver, but with his holy and precious blood and with his innocent suffering and death. All this he did that I should be his own and live under him in his kingdom and serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence and blessedness, just as he has risen from death and lives and rules eternally. This is most certainly true. Please be seated.
this holy day, dear Father, we rejoice to hear the good news of great joy that a Savior has been born for us. For fulfilling your prophecies and in the fullness of time, sending your Son to be our Savior, we give you our heartfelt thanks and praise. Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. What a great mystery of our faith this is, that God has become fully human for our salvation. Even though he is the all-powerful Lord of all, he is wrapped in strips of cloth and lying in a manger. Help us always believe that this precious child was born as our substitute to be our Savior. In the midst of our joy, we grieve for the many people in our world who do not know that Jesus has come to bring them forgiveness and healing. As the shepherds spread abroad the good news of the birth of the Savior born for all the world, may we also make use of the unique opportunities this holiday presents to tell others of what we have seen and heard concerning the child. Grant that the true faith between God and fallen mankind may comfort all people. As the angels sang out their praise, Move us also to sing out our praise to you today and every day as the joy of our Savior's birth remains in our hearts. Glory to God in the highest. Amen.
The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace.